Hey everyone, today I wanna to talk all about reassurance. I am up here in the mountains and it is starting to snow. So I do not know how long this video will be because I cannot feel my hands. So I wanna talk all about reassurance. The reason why we seek reassurance, the reason why it's very easy for people to tell you something isn't reassurance when it really is. Uh, again, why these misconceptions prevail and why it's so important to wear the uncertainty aspect when it comes to obsessive compulsive disorder recovery. And you can plug and chug this with any of the anxiety-based disorder recovery. <laughs> if I'm a little bit breathing a little bit, I'm, I'm at like 10,000 feet, so I'm a little bit above sea level. So before I go any further, please subscribe, hit that like button, comment down below. Uh, let me know what you think about this video. I'll, I'll turn it around at the end and show you the view where I am right now. I just spent the last few minutes trying to get my phone to prop up. It was like sideways. I was like, going to have to go like this. That wasn't working out for me. So what is reassurance? And I gotta make sure because this is a this is a straight drop off for like 150 feet. So, what is reassurance? Reassurance is the drug of choice for an OCD sufferer. So, you know, I hear things all the time where people will say, "Well, it's okay to ask for a little bit of reassurance," and you have to look at it in a realistic sense where that's like saying it's okay to drink two beers a day if you're an alcoholic. I mean, you can do that. You can accept yourself, but you're still engaging in alcoholism. You're not sober. You cannot recover if you're seeking or searching for reassurance in the, in the form of asking questions, your tone, how you say something. Uh, there, reassurance isn't just asking if something as simple as, is OCD recovery possible for me over and over and over again? Now, there are a lot of questions that if you ask them a few times throughout your OCD recovery journey, I mean, they're not compulsive. And, you know, people want to know how long does it take to recover? What does this mean? What does that mean? The first couple times you ask, it's not a big deal. I understand you're trying to learn about certain things. But there comes a point in time where the repetitive questions become reassurance seeking. And that's what we're talking about in this video. So I want to talk about some major points uh, in this video. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is why it's so hard to stop seeking reassurance. Again, reassurance is our drug of choice. When we have an intrusive image, sensation, urge, thought, whatever it is, uh, primarily automatic rumination, that zero to 100 sensation uh, or images and urges, the, the realness, the urge of it, the urgency to ask for reassurance feels life or death. So if you work with OCD and you don't have OCD and you're trying to watch this video to learn, understand that for the sufferer, it feels like they're walking on a plank. It feels as if they're about to drop off this plank into a pit of sharks. That's how real it feels. So in our mind, it makes logical sense to the OCD brain, it's obviously very irrational, to ask for this reassurance. So what do some of those reassurance questions look like? Am I a bad person? Do these thoughts define me? Am I going crazy? Do you think this is really who I am? It's really starting to snow right now. This is amazing. Um, I love it. Um, I heard that 20% of people with OCD don't recover. Uh, there's reassurance given in, in lots of, unfortunately, in OCD studies and the, and the conclusions. It's very easy to think that you can deduct something from a summary of a paper, but your life isn't in a paper. Your life is in the world. Uh, many people have heard me, I've made a video on the research in anything. People live their entire lives based off of a research study. Your life is not in the research. Your life is here. It's out here living and experiencing and learning and making mistakes and solving problems. Your life is not in the conclusions of a research study. That is not a great way to live your life, in my opinion. I know this because I did this for a long time with exercise physiology. It was something that held me back um, a lot. So I think that was really, really, really important to cover. So in those questions, you're never gonna get the certainty you're looking for. So let's say you have harm OCD, POCD, false memory, real event, and the common ones are, you know, am I a bad person? Am I a bad mother, bad father? Do these thoughts define me? And maybe someone says to you, oh, they're just thoughts. They're not really who you are. This is the one I hear a lot. OCD people are the least likely to, to commit their acts. This is like class A reassurance. You're just smacking a bottle of Jack Daniels if you were an alcoholic. Like that is what you're doing in the sense of asking for reassurance in an OCD sense. You're literally doing a drug. So when you're cutting out reassurance, something that Rob and I say, and I got this from Rob, is treating it like a drug. Treating it in the sense of this is not going to get me where I want. I'm better off cutting this out as quickly and efficiently as I can. But... A lot of people talk about the intrusive thoughts, 
but a lot of people don't talk about the intrusive urges. I really don't talk about the intrusive urges a whole lot because I primarily focus on GAD, panic disorder, and the sensation-based aspect of recovery. That's not that I don't know anything else. I just, those are the things that we like to speak on because of my experience with them. But the urges affected me just like anyone else with my body dysmorphia. So another way of looking for reassurance is in a behavioral action. So let's say you have an intrusive urge about anything. And it's that zero to 100 sensation. Now, everyone that's come to the webinars, this is how I say, right? If you look at it in like a category, it goes core fear. Okay, so you have a core fear. Let's say the fear of being rejected by society. You have an intrusive, which leads to an intrusive thought, image, sensation, or urge. That's that primarily automatic rumination. That branches down to a zero to 100 sensation. That's what makes it feel so real. That's the key. That's the key that turns the engine on, the fear, the intrusiveness, but then the realness. It turns it on. It's like, oh, this feels so real. Then that leads to some sort of a behavioral action. I don't put rumination in there because I separate rumination and analyzing. Now, people say, well, how do you know what's what? That's not what I'm trying to say. I just like to educate people that the rumination that you think you're trying to cut out is primarily automatic and will fire until the fear comes down. A lot of people are starting to catch on with that and they say, oh my gosh, I've been spending all this time trying to bring down rumination. The rumination, you could stop a lot of it. You really can, where you're like trying to figure it out, but you're not going to be able to stop that key, that zero to 100 sensation. You're not going to just, you're not going to be able to redirect your attention to the present moment. That's my favorite one. Just redirect your attention to the present moment. Um, redirecting your, your attention to the present moment does not work. We know that it doesn't work. It's very compulsive. People run around with yoga and meditation, and which is great. I love yoga and I love meditation, but they think they can force the present moment. The present moment is natural. I literally was just singing on this rock with my headphones on, literally with, with my hunting knife, because you got to bring a hunting knife because there's bears up here, you know? And I was like this. I was so present, but I wasn't thinking, am I present? Am I present? No. So the present, the present moment has gotten way too much hype. Present moment's great, can't force it, it's like sleep. So that zero to 100 sensation comes in. Oop, battery just went a little bit, there we go. So just hit my 20%. That zero to 100 sensation, and then you do a behavior, compulsion, reassurance seeking. So you have understanding the practicality about the OCD cycle will do you the, the most benefit, in my, in my opinion. So, so you're like, oh, okay, you're going through the journey and you're like, well, I get it now. I get why I feel so anxious because I'm so used to asking for reassurance, but I'm not asking for reassurance anymore. I'm sitting with that intrusive urge, sensation, et cetera. Typical Colorado, sun's coming out, snow's going away. It just raised like 20 degrees. I love this place. I love it. So sitting with that is so critical. And the reason why it's critical is because if you don't learn how to sit with discomfort, we always say wear anxiety like an uncomfortable coat, but we mean all discomfort. We mean physical symptoms of anxiety. We mean depersonalization, derealization, chronic shame, chronic guilt, clothing, sensory hyperawareness, weather hyperawareness, uh, conversation discomfort. The more you train yourself to sit with that, it's it's like a, a a workout. You're training yourself. It's like building a muscle. That's how I like to work at it. The the better off you'll be. I heard a great quote one time that said by a CrossFit athlete, Jeff Bridges, not the actor, CrossFit athlete, retired games athlete, who's a Navy SEAL. And he said, if Jeff Bridges, you ever find this, and thank you for this quote, said, um, how did he say it? Every time I go through a hardship, it's like I'm putting money into a savings account and I'm building up that savings account. I'm building up my tough skin. I love that. That was such a great metaphor to describe what's going on when it comes to OCD and anxiety recovery. So you got to look at the, those statements again, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll go through them again. Am I a bad person? Do these thoughts define me? How long does it take to recover? And then there's the tone. It's like, they might be asking something that might not seem like reassurance. This is what's easily missed when the person you're working with does not understand OCD, which unfortunately is the vast majority, is the tone. It's the tone of how they say it. It's not just the verbiage, it's the tone, it's the body language, it's how frequently they're saying something, the venting. A big one for me that I did was, I would say over and over again, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here. And, and we take that very seriously. But I was saying it so compulsively where Rob was like, you are saying this in a compulsive manner. You are looking for a reassurance from Erica to be like, it's okay, babe. You're going to be here. We love you. And 
when you stop asking for reassurance, your OCD symptoms will spike. A lot of people will go, I'm getting worse, I'm getting worse. You're not getting worse like that. What's happening is you're cutting out something that you've been feeding yourself that drug. So it's jacking up all your symptoms. This is a mistake I made by not understanding the practicality of OCD. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Remember the recap, you're not gonna be able to get the results you're looking for by continually asking for reassurance. Um, if anyone is telling you that these statements, am I a good person, you're the least likely to do that. Uh, th thoughts are thoughts, um, primarily using that as the main thing. Just redirect to the present moment. We know this doesn't work. We know it. The OCD sufferers know this the best. You can't fool us. We know. We've lived with this disorder 24-7, nonstop, many of us, for sometimes decades. So thank you so much for watching. Again, if you want to learn more about this, ooh, let me show you the view. Um, uh, uh, email info at OCDrecovery.com. God, I don't want to fall down this crack right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So... So there's the town down there. And then there's the trail, if you could see it. Cameron Cone. This is a bunch of snow up there. Pikes Peak. If you could see that line, I don't know if you could see that. That's where the train goes up. So it's, just, it's beautiful up here. It's, it's the most peaceful thing ever. I'm going to go back to singing now. Um, we're pretending to sing because I don't got a voice. <laughs> and I'm definitely not Bon Jovi. But I'm going to try. All right? Just trust me. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And as always, have a great day.